I really believe that every parent and teacher needs to have some basic training in non-punitive, non-coercive um, discipline tactics. Uh, because this really comes down to how do we invite a child to change their behavior um, and doing it without being punitive. Hi, I'm Ron Spurenberg, co-founder and CEO of Hi Mama. Welcome to our podcast about all things early childhood education. This episode is brought to you by Hi Mama. Did you know Hi Mama is a social purpose business? Our purpose is to improve learning outcomes for children aged zero to five. We give our time, talent, and dollars to impacting childcare because this sector is critically important. For more resources to help you with your work every day, visit HiMama.com slash blog and subscribe to our weekly newsletter where you can get news, resources, and templates delivered directly to you every Tuesday morning. That's HiMama, H-I-M-A-M-A dot com slash blog. Allison, welcome to the Preschool Podcast. Thank you for having me on. So, Allison, you're empowering families uh, by sharing your principles, rules, and tools for raising happy and healthy kids. And today we wanted to talk to you about routine and why routine is important. Maybe we can start with that question is why? Why is routine important for children? So routine, if you think about it, um, is allows you to understand what is going to happen next. It gives you a sense of, of anticipation so that you then know what's expected of you, how the world is unfolding. And from that, you can make choices about meeting those expectations, uh, stepping into to your role and doing your responsibilities. And then you feel competent and you see that the world is orderly and safe and predictable. So psychologically... Um, it, it, it's, it's sort of like meeting one of the baselines of, of Maslow's hierarchies of need, you know, um, maybe to an adult, think about how weird it would be and how strange and scary it would be if when you, you know, dropped a pee off the side of the high chair, instead of it going to the ground, it went up to the ceiling, but only randomly, only sometimes. I mean, it's, it's so much better to know that we have this thing called gravity and every time I let go of something it falls to the ground that actually makes us feel safe um, and I think that's why we get so disoriented when we have something like um, you know a uh, earthquake or something because the ground is supposed to be solid it's not supposed to shake and that's the same in a little kids world when we when we aren't routine when our homes are chaotic it really leaves a child feeling um, unsettled frightened don't know what to anticipate or expect. Um, this is not a good psychological space to be in for a child. They can't get that feeling of competency. Yeah, that's an interesting way to think about it that I never thought about before is, you know, to look at the extreme example of even as an adult, uh, if you never knew what was going to happen on any given day and it was going to be completely random, that would really obviously throw you for a bit of a loop, wouldn't it? Think about just going into work. You know, and oh, nobody showed up today. Don't people come to work Monday to Friday, nine to five? Why, why aren't people here? And oh, well, why is my boss screaming at me today? Did I, you know, <laughs> think of all the things that can be shifted in your environment if you haven't made sense of it yet. Uh, and so I think we sometimes forget that children are trying to make sense of their world. They're trying to order their world and find patterns. That's what the brain is wired to do, to find those patterns, to make rules about those patterns because that then gets put into a part of the brain that makes it sort of pre-conscious or automatic, and then we can put our attention to other things, more important things. So we're, we're constantly trying to find those patterns in our lives, and it's just easier if, if parents would step up and actually have some order and routine for kids, you know, kind of uh, spoon-feed them some of that that their brain is looking for. So let's just start by learning a little bit more about what we mean by – uh, routine or the opposite of uh, something that's a little bit more chaotic? Like, what is it that we're talking about? Is it just schedule? Is it environment? What can that all entail? So a good point, Ron, because it is a bit uh, global in when we're looking at the research for that. They actually use the word, we know the word chaotic, chaotic homes, but it's actually an acronym for um, the C stands for confusion, the H is hubbub, um, and 
an order scale. So they're looking at uh, overcrowding. They're looking at noise. Um, they're looking at um, attentiveness. They're looking at um, that same thing, that predictability. Do, you know, so they'll ask questions on a questionnaire, things like, um, is your house a real zoo? And then it's like, you know, agree, disagree, kind of, you know, um, can you hear yourself think? Uh, do you have a regular bedtime? These are the types of questions that they're looking for when they're trying to analyze how chaotic an environment is for a child. And, and again, that could be a home environment. That could be a classroom environment. That could be a school bus. You know, um, it's it's that surrounding environment, both physical and social elements in it. Okay, so let's say there is a really chaotic home. Um, what is going to be the result of that for that child? So what the research is showing, and they've been studying this for quite a while, that there's quite a few adverse effects. Um, Things that they've looked at is higher levels of aggression, poor sleep patterns, higher stress, uh, worse vocabulary and language deficits, uh, more uh, uh, conduct um, disorders, conduct problems, um, more uh, issues around attention deficit hyperactivity uh, symptoms. So it's, it's... you know, pretty far-reaching, actually. Hmm. So significant consequences, clearly. Now, yeah. what about how we deal with this? So what can <laughs> we do? <laughs> what we can we do well, as parents, early childhood educators, to get those routines in place? Yeah, well, I think the first thing is, is uh, to just be committed to the idea that they're important, you know? So uh, you're going to be way more motivated if you realize that you're going to get better behavior, you're going to have better outcomes, it's going to be more peaceful for you as a care provider if things are calm. And then the second thing is to start really, really slowly and be patient and to just bite off one small routine. So in a classroom environment, you might want to just start off with how you get those kids in the door and how they hang up their coats and how shoes need to go in the cubby and where slippers need to get put on and what that, and to get themselves ushered to the first Um, activity area of the day that might take an early childhood uh, provider from September to like November in in a classroom where you've got kids you know 18 months to two and a half years old or whatever that takes a lot of time to get a group of kids all you know routinized into this is how this is how we do it um, but again, then you'll start to see they just walk in, they hang up their coats, grab their slippers, they're off to do their things, no instructions, no prompting, and you have less reminding, nagging, fighting, uh, tears, all those things start to come down and people start to feel very competent and capable. And you can say, look at you looking after yourself. You really know how to our, our routine in the classroom. They love all that positive um, feedback. They love knowing that they're being socially successful this way. And so this this all sounds like a really great situation, but as we know, sometimes things can uh, devolve quickly, <laughs> and then all of a sudden we're, <laughs> we're we... back into uh, a chaos. So, what do you have any tips or or ways to sort of deal with situations where things really aren't working the way that we had planned them to work? Right. Well, I think first thing is we think about what are the things that we can control. Um, so again, just going back to a classroom environment, if things are getting chaotic, if, if you start talking quieter, right? Normally we want to scream over the kids, but if we actually start talking quieter and if we turn off the lights, dim the lights, turn off the music so that the ambient sound goes down, um, that getting calmer in the environment will help take some of the stress load off kids. So those are things, you know, we can turn the lights down. We, you know, now we're looking at what we can do about their behavior. And that's where I really believe that every parent and teacher needs to have some basic training in non-punitive, non-coercive um, discipline tactics. Uh, because this really comes down to how do we invite a child to change their behavior um, and doing it without being punitive. And I see in too many environments that we either use punishment or we use sticker charts and rewards. And these prove, again, by research, that you might get a short-term improvement in behavior. That you might be able to coerce the child temporarily, but it's not the same as winning the child's cooperation, which is what we're really trying to do. We want them to be helpful in the classroom, helpful in sticking to the routines, 
not out of fear, not because they want more gym time or a longer iPad time, but just because they know it's the right thing to do. You know, and, and under five, kids can be trained to do this. So a, a small example of a tool that a parent might not have thought of is um, we call it a when-then statement. So it, it, what it does is, is rather than controlling the child, you're controlling the environment. So if it's a requirement that you hang up your coat and put your slippers on before you come over to the puzzle table, you could just, when they come over and their coat's all over the floor, you could just simply say, hey, hey, you know what, Jacob, Jacob, when your coat's put away, then I know you're ready for the puzzle table. <laughs> so it's, it, which replaces nagging and it replaces threats. Hey, 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 you know, no, no puzzle till your coat's hung up. It, it's a very small change in the language, but the intention behind it and how it lands on kids is completely different. So a when-then statement will help keep routine in order. Um, you know, hey, boys and girls, we can't move on to snack time until all the toys are put away. We need to put, do our cleanup time. So when they're cleaned up, then we have snack. Um, and again, it takes a little while, though you have to be patient. you got to allow more time for cleanup in the beginning. Um, but with repetition and holding kids regularly accountable, Again, predictability of your response to them not cleaning up. If it's consistent, they they will learn. They will they will realize that the benefit of cleaning up quickly is they get to the snack table sooner. You know, it's interesting because it, it's almost kind of to me sounds like you're learning some things that are very important for you in the adult world as well, right? You know, you don't get reward until you put in hard work and you're persistent and diligent and whatever it is you're doing and you have uh some accountability with you know this when then philosophy um you know you you can get something uh a reward or uh, something that will benefit you but you do have some responsibility or accountability in order to receive that exactly and that and that's the whole part about um teaching kids to be self-directed autonomous good problem solvers good decision makers all of that happens when you to your point, hold the, just hold them accountable for what needs to happen without getting into manipulation tactics. So the same, here's another example of, of um, keeping um, routines in place and order in the classroom without using punishment, is you can bring the problem to the kids. Like even, again, I have very young kids when I was a preschool teacher, and we would say things like, you know, boys and girls, it doesn't look like anybody's interested in cleaning up the blocks whenever we are trying to get cleaned up for snack time. Nobody seems to like that job. So um, in order for us to have the blocks out, we need to have someone who's willing to clean them up. Otherwise, if no one's willing, then we'll just leave, let the blocks sleep today and we'll just keep them covered up and we won't play with them at playtime today. And so somebody will say, no, I actually really want to play with the blocks. I'd be willing to be the cleanup person. And then we can say, well, thank you very much for helping our classroom. That's really great. You know, um, Jenna has agreed to clean the blocks at cleanup time. Thank you. So, you know, we've we've come about it as making it kind of like a consequence or, or tying those freedoms and responsibilities together. If you'd like to have the blocks, you have to be willing to clean them up. If you're not willing to clean them up, then we don't use them. You know, it's the same with, it's the, same with um, the sand table. The sand needs to stay in the sand table. If sand goes on the floor, that tells me we're not able to be at the sand station. We'll need to move to a different um, activity station. You know, or if people are splashing the water, then we take the water out of the the, the uh, water table and we close that for today and we'll try again tomorrow and so those are all great um, examples of using consequences they're not punitive doesn't you don't have to raise your voice uh, we don't have to get angry doesn't have to get into this interpersonal turf or power struggle just very simple um, showing kids what needs to happen now what if I'm being very diligent from from my end as a parent and I'm dropping my child off at a child care early learning program, and I don't really know how they're managing routines there, or vice versa. Maybe I'm an early childhood educator, and I'm doing a really great job uh, with managing routines with my children during the day, but I really have no clue what the family's doing in the evening. Uh, do you have any thoughts or recommendations about how early childhood educators and families can work together to establish a cohesive routine for, for children? Well, I, I love the idea of home and school working collaboratively and together. I, you want the child to feel like your allies and rather than an antagonistic relationship between your teacher and your friends at school and your parents. So you do want that feeling like everyone's on the same page. 
But having said that, my experience has much more, more been that early childhood educators get more training in child development, get more training on how to establish routines in their classrooms than a parent does on running a home. <laughs> so I, my, my experience is that kids tend to do very well in the classroom um, and, and they like those routines and it's often home where there's more problems. Now, having said that, uh, it's often that kids, it's not so much the absence of routine, although it contributes, um, but there's often you give a greater importance to your relationship with your parent than you do to your teacher. So if there's an interpersonal issue happening, you'll see a kid is not thriving at home because something's going on in that relationship or parents are less likely to be consistent than a teacher needs to be. If you've got 22 kids, you don't have time to be inconsistent. You, you, know, you have yeah. to kind of move through, you have to kind of move through the day, you know? Um, so I think we have to respect the behaviors in order to understand kids' behavior. It really depends on the social field in which the behavior occurs. And they know that school is different than home is different than grandma's. And at school, we have to line up like this. And at home, we don't. And at grandma's, we have to act like this. And kids can manage to understand three separate sets of rules or understand three different patterns of operating. That does not confuse them. What's more important is that um, that parents and grandmothers and teachers are consistent themselves every day so that whatever routine is established in each of those environments, that, it, that day to day to day, it's the same. So you might find, for example, a child knows to hang up their coat and, and do their slippers for, in the classroom, and at home, mom hangs up their coat. <laughs> They're completely capable, but because mom's never held the child accountable, the kid drops it on the front foyer, so mom, goes, mom says, pick it up, pick it up, pick it up. The kid doesn't pick it up, so mom says, oh, forget it. I don't want the fight. I'll just hang it up myself. You know, so you think you're teaching your child the routine of when we come in, we hang up our coat, but you're not teaching it because, in essence, you're really teaching them that that's not really a rule, that you'll pick it up. That's, that's what the real lesson is, uh, although parents don't like to believe it. Kids learn from what you do, not from what you say. Um, so I think having that conversation where you could say, actually, you know what, um, a Jessica is very capable of hanging up her coats and putting on her own shoes now. Um, you know, she can tie her shoes. We've seen her. So that would be really great if we could let her um, also be responsible for that at home. That would be a great suggestion. Um, and, you know, and hopefully you'll get some buy-in from, from the parents. Yeah, I think you're right. The, obviously, early childhood educators are educated and trained on their work. So to the extent that they can provide suggestions uh, about how to create more routine at home, that's going to benefit the child, I think, makes a, a lot of sense. And they're certainly in a position to do that. Yeah. And they, and you know, they'll know what a child's capable of. And one of the, uh, your listeners will attest to this, that one of the things we talk about in terms of a milestone is a child being able to execute three consecutive um, instead of instructions, which I just said, I say, hang up your coat, put on your slippers and go to the puzzle table. That's three distinct tasks back to back that you're asking them to do. And so that takes a certain amount of cognitive development, a certain um, executive functioning has to be developed for kids to be able to follow three instructions. Um, so some kids may not be there yet. Some kids may need just the single prompt, to just coats now, then now let's do slippers. So uh, an early childhood educator could see over the course of the day, you know, or in the time that they're at school, how that grows from one to two to three as they move along that continuum of being able to execute three, three tasks. 100%. This has been a very helpful and practical advice uh, for me personally as a parent and I think for our listeners as early childhood educators. If I want to find you online to learn more about uh, some of your tips uh, for parenting and for routines of, of children at a young age, where can I go to get in touch with you or get more of your content? Well, thank you for asking, and I would love to share more, which is why my website is so content-rich. I've got all kinds of posts, uh, and actually in quite a few just on this very specific topic alone, but lots and lots of topics for this age group on my website, which is my name, alisonshaper.com. Um, and, of course, it's the worst spelling, so I'm going to spell it A-L-Y-S-O-N-S-C-H-A-F-E-R.com. Um, and I also have a robust Facebook uh, professional page 
And um, there's lots of information that I'm posting on a daily basis there too. And once a month, I even have a Facebook Live where if people want to ask me questions, um, we can engage through that um, medium as well, which is really fantastic. People like to be able to have access to an expert. So I, I would also encourage anyone who wants regular information about upcoming events and webinars and, and whatnot to sign up for my e-newsletter so that you, know, you can get pinged in your mailbox what's coming up. Awesome. That's some great stuff. And uh, I love the Facebook Live uh, opportunity. I'm sure lots of parents would jump on that opportunity to, to ask questions. I know, I know my wife and I, we always have questions um, that we're, we're Googling all the time. So, <laughs> Well, and you know what? I, I think the other thing that's really powerful for parents is they, they really need to hear that they're not alone. You know, when you, you just, you're listening to other people post questions and you're like, oh, you know, I'm not the only one who's got the kid who's still up at 1030 at night, even though they're only six years old because they're jumping up on their bed. And, you know, <laughs> it's it's very normalizing to find out that other people are having the same challenges as you. So um, I, I find the, you get good information, but you also feel that sense of community and support. Yeah, totally. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, well, Allison, it's been really a pleasure having you on the show. I've learned a lot, as I said, and uh, I really like your approach to a more of a partnership with the child and giving them accountability and responsibility in order to create those routines that are really going to help them at the end of the day. Uh, it's been very insightful. Thanks so much for coming on the show. My pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. Are you looking to make an impact in your classroom and get rid of the time you spend on documentation and paperwork? Hi Mama is the top rated parent communication app with state and provincial frameworks included within our web mobile tool. Make 2018 the year you throw out those binders and save yourself the administrative headaches. You really can spend more of your time and important talent on what matters, improving learning outcomes for children. Visit HiMama.com for more information. And when you talk with one of our community advisors, be sure to mention the preschool